Welcome to the Practical Animal channel with me, John Beaumont. Our next guest is Bob Dalton. Bob is a lifelong falconer who has published books on falconry and a quarterly magazine, The World of Falconry. Recently, he has set up Project Lugger, and he joins us today to talk about his work. Bob Dalton, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Good evening, John. Thank you. Bob, you've published several books and the World of Falconry magazine. Uh -huh. How did you become a successful writer and publisher on the subject? If I tell you, you probably won't believe me, but I read an article years ago in a, a magazine I think is defunct now, but I was sitting reading it in front of someone and about eight or nine times apparently I said what rubbish it was and how the person had taken a thousand words to say nothing. And the person I was talking to said, they got sick of it and said, if you can do better, write something yourself. So I did and I sent it into a magazine and they published it and they asked for another one and it, it snowballed from there. I had no formal training, no desire to be a writer. It just literally snowballed from that, that incident that day. But it is, it's something I enjoy. And I also find it quite cathartic because you can vent your frustrations in the form of the printed word and know that it's there for a long, long time. This book was Falconry Reflections, about my first sort of 20, 30 years in falconry. Then it was uh, Hunting with Harris Hawks, then Hunting with Aplomado Falcons, both species I've flown quite a few of. And then I wrote a book on my favourite of all, The Passage Falcon which is basically uh, a peregrine falcons in their first year in the wild, which is, let me stress, illegal in Great Britain. But uh, many years ago, when I first started, was legal. I think obviously things have changed and things have improved. Um, but in other countries where peregrines are in very big numbers and pass through in big numbers, it's still legal. So the book had some relevance. And... Many falconers coming up through the ranks today are never ever going to fly a passage falcon because it will, it will legally not be within their, their remit to do so. So I think it's nice to read about how it was. How did you get into falconry? Uh, my uncle worked in India when I was a child and for a birthday present one year he gave me a leather object and I, I said to him, what is it? I was only a kiddie. And I said, what is it? And he said, your mum says you're a clever boy, find out. And it was a hood for a cheetah, because cheetahs are trained in the same way for hunting as falcons are. They're hooded, they're dieted, they're, they're uh, got fit over a, a regime. And it was, my mother took me to the Natural History Museum and there was a picture in there of two hooded cheetahs and that's what this object was I'd been given. Now my parents being mean wouldn't let me have a cheetah, but a falcon was the next best thing, so. We went down that road. Oh, absolutely fantastic. Um, there's other things I want to talk about, but I want to get very quickly onto Project Lugger. Can uh -huh. you tell us about it? What is it? Right, well, when I first started falconry, uh, let me, I, my first, I killed my first head of quarry with a falcon in the day man landed on the moon in 69, so a long time ago. And because there were so few of falconers, birds of prey were still taken from the wild legally not from this country so much, but from abroad and then imported. And one of the birds that was imported in huge numbers was a lugger falcon. And because it was cheap and because it was readily available, it was almost dismissed. Although it has massive potential, it was dismissed. People wanted more exotic things, peregrines, sakers, etc. But they were everywhere. When I was 19, 20, 21, they were everywhere. And then a few years ago, I was looking around because I wanted another lugger and I just couldn't find one. And I started researching a little bit as to their numbers in the wild and how many were in Europe. And I was staggered that they'd gone in the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s, there were in excess of 100,000 luggers in the wild, estimated. And three years ago, when I decided to start this project, it was a result of finding out there's approximately 12,000. The big thing that affects lugger falcons is the removal of their primary food source. 
in the countries they come from, Burma or Myanmar as it is now, India, Pakistan, where people are poor and can't afford doctors, traditional homeopathic remedies still are widely used. And the main food of the lugger when it has young is a, is a, a, a reptile called a spiny-tailed lizard. It's really quite a chunky thing. Good meal for a falcon. But the homeopathic uh, medicine says that if you boil one of these and then use the resulting oil and just smear it wherever you happen to have a problem, it will cure everything from testicular cancer to miscarriages to migraines. It's a, a panacea for everything. But of course it's not. But if you can't afford to take your family to a doctor because you're so poor and you can catch one of these lizards and boil it, that's fine, but they're being caught in their thousands. And the traditional food source for the luggers when they've got young is being eradicated. The other big thing that affects them is illegal. Let me stress illegal, because Pakistan has some very good falconers and some very caring falconers. But there is an illegal trade in trapping falcons. So the lugger is trapped, it has its eyes sewn together, has its legs tied together, a bundle of nooses slung down from its feet. When the trapper sees a saker or a peregrine that it desires to trap, it throws the lugger out as live bait. So of course, if they do end up catching the saker or the peregrine, the lugger dies. And at one time, horrendous amounts of luggers were being taken from the wild for this. So the population is already under threat. And then the, the trappers are indiscriminate. They don't care if they take a young bird, an old bird. They don't care if they take birds during the breeding season. So Project Lugger was designed to one, try and halt that decline, and two, set up a captive breeding program. Um, we've reached a stage even after only three years where we have 48 luggers together in Britain now. We've bred our first young this year. An establishment is being constructed as we do this interview near Islamabad. And some of the luggers that we breed next year will go to Pakistan. Not for release because that's just a waste of time, they'll die. But they will make up the breeding stock and when they breed, those young will be for release. But the beauty is they won't go till next year because we haven't bred enough yet. And they have then got to get to maturity and breed. So that gives us four to five years to try and sort areas that are safe for release. that are not just offering them up for these trappers. But laws in Pakistan are changing. I was at 50. There are, there are, there are quite a few more, but uh, there are one or two people still trying to breed them commercially, which is a great shame because, you know, we should all get together and try and save this species. Uh, and there's a normal thing, of course, where you don't know everybody. So someone over here will have a lugger and someone over there. If we can, that's why we're so desperate to spread the word because we don't want to take their luggers. We don't want to buy their luggers. But if we say, have a, find someone with a, a, an adult female, let's give them a male. That's what we've been doing. We've been giving them to centers. We don't sell luggers. We are a charity. We raise money, we buy the luggers. But 16 centres in the UK now fly a lugger for the people, the, the visiting people to see when Corona is not at its, you know, as it is at the moment. But we've provided those because we want people to learn, want people to become aware. When those luggers are three or four years old, we'll have them back. Give that centre another one so they can continue. But it means we've got good breeding stock. And instead of those poor luggers having just sat in an aviary for three or four years of their life, They've flown every day, been used every day, been ambassadors for the project. So they're fitter physically and mentally. So we think that's the right way to go. So how will you go about assessing remaining habitat suitability in the wild? Right, OK, that's, that's really in the hands of the Pakistanis, the Indians, obviously, with a little advice from us and also we've now the peregrine fund are coming on board as advisors not as full partners but as advisors i can't go to working with people not trying to impose our will upon them and i think because of that type of attitude we've actually got we've got partners now in holland belgium france germany italy we've just sent two pairs of luggers to italy uh, free of charge uh, we've got Greece want to come on board, we've got Myanmar, what was Burma, they're, they're cooperating with us now. Um, the Pakistani Falconers Club and several Pakistani government bodies just here, when we go on trips like this, we don't take any money, we pay for ourselves. The money we raise in the charity is only for luggers. It's written into our constitution that no one can have travelling expenses. 
So it cuts out, not that any of us would, but it cuts out an outsider thinking perhaps they do. So we paid for ourselves to go to India. We met some amazing people who have some amazing knowledge of luggers, but every single person told us that, you know, it used to be in this area, five pairs, this area, 10 pairs now, maybe one, maybe none. Everyone has agreed the numbers are plummeting and everyone agrees we need to be doing something about it, but actually getting someone from the... the what captive population size are you looking at building up in captivity before you start releasing? Really, if, if you, we don't want to double clutch birds. I'm sure you understand captive free. We don't want to double clutch. We want birds to be natural, healthy, strong, genuinely parent reared. So we're just looking for one clutch a year. So we think if we can get 20 pairs together that actually breed, then that's, this is going to make a massive difference. You know, because we, we want, to, our aim would be to send sufficient youngsters to Pakistan to make up 20 pairs there, unrelated pairs. We want to do, when we can get India, which we will sooner or later, we'll get them on board. We want to send, you know, probably 30, enough to make up 30 pairs there. So it's, it's going to be an ongoing process for quite a few years. What we have decided to do as a charity, most of the money we've raised has gone on purchasing luggers, on purchasing the materials to make uh, breeding aviaries for them. We feel now that having produced, we had some in, produced in Portugal this year by one of our partners, as well as here in the UK. So we feel now we've spent enough money on actual buying actual luggers, unless we find a bloodline that we didn't know about previously. So what we're going to do now is concentrate on the educational side of things. We've produced activity packs, which is with schools. So we've had a couple of school visits. We're going to go into schools with a lugger and give a talk, but we're going to give every child one of these activity packs, which has got a bird they can color and a, a couple of quizzes in it and some information. There's also a leaflet in there, a sticker, and we give every child a, a wrist, a project like a wristband, which has the website address on it. So, you know, if just one, one child in a hundred takes it to heart and takes interest, that's another convert and someone else to, to, to help spread the Or um, only doing captive breeding and not double clutching. Does that mean then you don't have to do any wild hacking? And in, in India and Pakistan, if we give them youngsters and they breed youngsters there, then yes, they can be let out on a, on a, a long-term hack, but just gradually let them hack back, not take them back in. So that's one of the plans we've got for out there, but not for here. Will you be operating in those three countries, Myanmar, Pakistan and India? Pakistan, we've got the go ahead. As I say, I'm going back in January to sort some of the, the, the further details out. Myanmar, we're very lucky. The population there is pretty steady um, because uh, for whatever reason, and God forbid that they get the idea, but they don't do the illegal trap in there to provide the illegal falconry trade with sakers and peregrines. There aren't sakers there, there are a few peregrines. But even so, we would in areas where they were at one time uh, in higher numbers, if the food sources are still there and nesting facilities there, then yes, we'd like to provide them. Another country I visited personally about three years ago, where luggers have been recorded in the northwestern part of the territory. And I'm great friends with the falconers and some of the conservation people there was Uzbekistan. So eventually, if we can, I'd like to get some luggers to Uzbekistan and get them released there. But we have to be careful not to release them in areas where sakers are a resident because sakers will kill them. So. It, it takes lots of um, lots of fine tuning, lots of little bit tweaks to, to get things right. But in three years, we you know three years, three and a half years ago, this was just an idea as I was driving along. Now we have forty nine luggers here. We have partners in eleven countries. We're supported by uh, the International Association for Falconry and Conservation. We have the Hawk Board helping us. We have the Peregrine Fund supporting us. You know, we've come we've got a long way to go, but we've come a tremendous distance. I'm very proud of not only the project, but everybody involved in it. It's not, I'm talking to you about the project. Once you release the birds in the wild in country, will you be doing any supplementary feeding? It shouldn't be necessary. And if it is necessary, then I'm afraid they wouldn't, they wouldn't be going to make it anyway, in my opinion. 
they need to be released in areas where there is sufficient food um, before they're released they need to be fit and capable of catching food that's why i i would suggest hacking them back long term just you know how hack works but instead of taking them up after a limited period just just leave them supplement them perhaps when they're first at hack but as they start killing for themselves then just just leave them grown nesters bob in the wild or are no they they nest in uh they nest in trees, but in, in India now, they're a lot, they nest in pylons because like all birds of prey, they're basically lazy. Crows and ravens, which are not as big as ours in India and Pakistan, nest a great deal on pylons. So the luggers drive them from there. When they, when they nest in trees, what they tend to do is they use the nests of Egyptian vultures and they drive them off and use their nest. They're not nest builders. You know, they, they, they... In British falconry, what kind of quarry and what kind of habitat would you fly them in? Uh, you'd, you'd fly them as you would probably a lanner, in relatively, relatively open country. Certainly you, can, you could in, uh, fly them in more enclosed country than you could a peregrine, but it does need to be open. Um, when I was younger, when I was 19, 20, I flew them at Rooks off of the fist, so you, you needed good open farm. And at the moment, you're putting to get your compiling artwork, aren't you, for a book on the lugger? I'm doing a book on luggers, uh, and uh, we thought it'd be nice. Uh, initially, it, it's like all these things, it's grown. Initially, we thought it'd be nice to have um, some people within the project give us some artwork, not to donate the piece to raise money, just to donate the use of it in the book. But we had 20 something artists all promised us work now. And then we've had two wildlife photographers in India promise us, and they've sent me some amazing photographs of luggers in the nest with eggs and chicks. How uh, did you start to, uh, how did you start the magazine? Was it, was it, was it totally independent of what used to be the Raptor and Falconry Conservation magazine? Absolutely, 100%. I, I started my, my own magazine, The World of Falconry, because I felt that, at the time, there was another magazine called International Falconer as well. And that was very, very, uh, very well produced. Fantastic uh, photographic work in it. Um, initially, very, very good articles. But like so many things, it, I, it didn't go down in quality. It's a, it's a, so I wanted to produce a magazine where the focus was falconry, which is what we did. And we're now in our 11th year, I think. And in actual fact, we bought Falconry and Raptor Conservation magazine about two and a half, three years ago and incorporated it. So and I'm the, very proud of it anyway. Well done. The publishing company is Falcon Leisure, is that right? Well, no, it's, um, we've moved on now. The, the people that print my books is Solent Design Publishing, which is just local to me. And, and the guy who runs it is one of trustees of Project Lugger. So we now, we now do it through them. But I, I'm the editor, I put the magazine together, et cetera, et cetera. So we have an, a really good working relationship. And I do mean good, you know, we discuss things, we bounce ideas backwards and forwards. So we, we like to think it's a good quality magazine that doesn't have, it doesn't have space fillers in it. The, the beauty, I think, but perhaps the advantage we have over other magazines, I'll say my words carefully, is because I've been a falconer for more than 50 years, if, if we had a shortfall, which has only ever happened once or twice, I can write something that would, would fit. I, I'm not desperate for someone to fill, send me an article and I'll use it no matter what. If, it's, if I don't think it's good, it doesn't go in. I don't think it's relevant because there, there's many articles I put in that's not my personal point of view or my own personal taste, but that doesn't mean the readership won't like them. So I do look at it from an editor's point of view, not a personal, or I try to anyway. But that's that's our big difference is if there is a shortfall, I can write something and make it up. You know, I've been to about, I was counting out the other day, I don't know why I was talking to someone. I think I've been to and seen Falconry in 37 different countries. Have you? So you can always go. Red list, the, uh, the red data. Uh, pain yes, it's, of, that's, that is a pain in our side at the moment. That's our big, big pain in the side. There seems to be quite literally nothing on the Red Data website. 
about luggers? No, there isn't. But the, the problem is they, they classify the lugger as near threatened. Okay. Now, if I approach a um, company for sponsorship for luggers, they look on there and it's, oh, it's near threatened. It's not threatened. It's near threatened. And there's almost this attitude, well, there's plenty of time. Well, if they were near threatened, then now's the time to jump in, stop becoming threatened. But they're not. They are threatened. The IC, IUCN, they use figures. As far as I can see, this is my opinion. They use figures that were first banded about seven years ago. Seven years ago, those figures were approximations of figures from a few years previously. The other thing is when they describe birds, which they, they have to have some yardstick, they do them in groups of 10,000. So naught to 10,000 is threatened. 10,000 to 20,000 is near threatened. Now, if that's 10,000 and one bird, it's still near threatened. If it's 19,999, it's near threatened. So the band is so wide that it's, it's difficult to actually realize how bad they are. But when you speak to conservationists face to face in India and Pakistan, and as I said to you before, they say when I was younger, there were five pairs here, 10 pairs, pairs here. Now there's one or none. And I hear that again and again and again. I'm, several professional photographers I spoke to. Um, I said, have you photographed a lugger this year? No, I haven't seen one. And I said, well, how many would you normally photograph? Well, 10 years ago, 10, 15, now none. So the figures need reappraisal. And once they are reappraised and accurate, we, we don't want to make it, we don't want to make them change their opinion because we say so. But if they would make it a realistic figure, then we we would have far more confidence approaching people to help us. But they, those that are interested take a look and they say well they're near threatened but this is threatened the other big thing of course if you take india as an example if you try and get a company to help you save a falcon in india which is just plain brown you know peregrine's got a fantastic face and sakers are big and powerful the same country has problems with snow leopards tigers asian elephants asiatic lions much much easier to raise money to help them than some falcon that's drab, not particularly colourful, and most people have never heard of. This is the, the big, big problem. But there we go. Somebody looking at this video and seeking a career, working with animals, working with birds of prey, perhaps considering either becoming a professional author or becoming a field biologist on Project Lugger, what qualities would they need? What qualifications? What advice have you got to somebody aspiring to that occupation? Right. Oh, all I can tell you is when I was younger, I when first left school, I had normal jobs. And I, I was, some of them were very well paid, but I wasn't particularly happy. And then I made my mind up. I wanted to have falconry as, and birds of prey as my career. And I went from earning good money to earning practically nothing being someone's junior, et cetera, et cetera. I think you just have to choose the path you want to go down, knuckle down, and just accept that the first, you have to prove yourself effectively. But, and that's what I did. I just sort of, I took loads of stuff I certainly wouldn't take at my age now, but you know, you, you just have to go with the flow. And if the one thing my, um, I thank my mother for on a daily basis is I had a good education. And I would say to anybody, no matter how tempting it is to leave school early, get a good education. You have this argument all the time if you talk to young people, they say, yeah, if I've got a GCE in maths or a GCE in, or whatever they are nowadays, I'm so out of touch, I don't know, but whatever the qualifications are nowadays in this, this and this, it means nothing, I'm never going to use it. Perhaps you're not, but the, the training process of your mind is what was expanded by learning those things. Be able to think on your feet and be able to switch and adapt to do different things. So I think education is absolutely vital. I wish, well, I wished at my age now I'd have had the opportunities that were around now when I was a youngster. Uh, is this something that you touch upon in your book, Falcon? 20 years or so. 
and the other three have been um, about specific flying specific types of raptor. The one that I've got coming out in January is my travels around the world and, and seeing falconry in, in various places. And I've also published um, three transcripts of old falconry books that were written in Elizabethan English. And because I love to read them, it used to drive me crazy trying to piece the old English together. So I've transcribed and published them in modern English but without changing the meaning or the tone in any way. But it means someone can pick it up and just actually read it, as opposed to keep trying to find out what this word means, that word means, and so on. And are these available on the Solent Publishing website? Yes, they are, yeah. yeah. Have you anything else, Bob, that you'd like to add? Not really, I just, I, obviously I would like people to take a look at our website if they have time, which is www.projectlugger.com. We have a Facebook page, Project Lugger. Um, they can, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask me directly, you can contact, you know, my, my personal contact details are on there. I'd never mind helping anybody. When I first set up, I always remember the great boost it was to the one that would. And he didn't help me to a massive extent. It was the fact he would help me and would answer my questions always gave me in the back of my mind that I had almost like a, a safety net the fact that someone would talk to me if I was hard pressed so if, if anybody ever needs help I do what I can I mentor several young falconers at the moment I don't have children myself I'm not a great lover. so it's easier to be kind than it is to be nasty Bob thank you very much indeed for being on the Practical Animal Channel no problem pleasure been great talking Cheers, to you John. thank you very much thanks a lot Okay.